Well, good afternoon. My name is Carlin Bowman. I'm a senior fellow here at AEI. I've been at AEI for a very long time, and when I arrived in 1979, William J. Baruti was president of the Institute. And Baruti, one of the first things that all of the newbies learned from William J. Baruti Sr. was that he was committed to the competition of ideas. It was the slogan that defined AEI in our early years. We started a series of rational debates in 1967, and in the first year, we had Milton Friedman, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Paul Samuelson, and Ronald Coase. And so you have a lot to live up to in tonight's debate. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's debate, Is It Time to End the Exxon Bank? And I am here to introduce Ben White, someone I've never met, but someone I've been a great fan of for a very long time. Ben is Politico's chief economic correspondent and author of the Must Read Every Morning, Morning Money, a column that covers the nexus of finance and public policy. Before joining Politico in the fall of 2009, he served as a Wall Street reporter for the New York Times, where he shared a, a Society of Business Editors and Writers Award for breaking news coverage for the financial crisis. From 2005 to 2007, White was the Wall Street correspondent and U.S. banking editor at the FT. White worked at the Washington Post for nine years before joining the Financial Times. He served as national political researcher and research assistant to columnist David Broder, and later as a Wall Street correspondent. Welcome, Ben, and good luck in the day thank tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlin. I want to apologize to everybody for being a couple of minutes late. I think we should shift this debate to whether Washington, D.C. should be allowed to have vehicle traffic uh, anymore. <laughs> and I think the answer to that is an obvious no, because people don't know how to go negotiate it. Um, I'm not going to read the full bios for these two uh, uh, gentlemen uh, so we can get more quickly to the meat of this uh, debate, but uh, Tony Prado, I'm sure many of you know, uh, Hamilton Place Strategies partner, uh, Bush White House veteran, uh, expert on uh, many things in the financial markets and the uh, connection between D.C. and Wall Street, uh, also a CNBC contributor. Uh, Timothy Carney uh, is best known for being mean to me on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> other things he's known for uh, are a couple of books that he's written. He's a visiting fellow at AEI. Obviously, we'll take the position uh, that the Exim Bank is uh, corporate welfare at its worst, crony capitalism that has no place uh, in a free market system, uh, that its time has come to be uh, not just dismantled, but just not renewed when its uh, charter is up uh, at the end of September. Uh, Tony will argue the case that it makes perfect sense to continue to have export uh, support for U.S. companies uh, who are competing in a global marketplace, often against uh, other large uh, nations who do a whole lot more export credit assistance uh, than we do. Uh, and we didn't flip a coin or anything for who got to go first and give a few seven minutes of opening remarks. I don't know if you guys feel strongly about who gets to kick things off. Uh, if you don't, um, I will just uh, allow Tony to start, and then we'll go to Tim, and then I'll ask some questions, and then we'll go to Q&A. So, so the visiting team Brothers. gets to go first. Yeah, there we go. I don't, know, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I have seven, um, I don't know if I have seven minutes or not, but I'll just let me just t talk and try to, try to set this up uh, a little bit and why uh, I actually, as a really uh, strong pro-AEI, uh, pro-free markets guy, uh, really believes in uh, the need for XM uh, in the world we are today, and why this is why this is really necessary. So, first of all, th th there's a lot of a lot of uh, language tossed around about the firms that we are talking about, and I just want to begin by saying something that is really meaningful to me, important to me about the firms that we're talking about. A lot of the, the big uh, big U.S. firms who get called names around this debate uh, quite a bit. Here's some of the finest firms in the world, in fact, not just national leaders, but global leaders. The very, very best, we're talking about GE, Boeing, um, uh, Caterpillar, I mean, not just great national firms, but global leaders, great innovators. Now, what these firms do is they compete around the world on quality, innovation, price, delivery, service, all around the world. All U.S. firms, all the, the firms, uh, American firms who, who export, a lot of them are really incredible, do a great job. 98% of the exports that they, they do does not, does not require, is this Japanese? AEI maybe? has cut you <laughs> off already. That's enough out of you. But not, <laughs> no, does not require uh, export credit uh, assistance at all of any kind, 98%. Some people throw that around as 
a criticism of X, uh, of, of X impact, that it's small and insignificant and, and not necessary. It's actually the opposite in my mind. What that tells me is that uh, XM is actually additive, it's very narrowly scoped, it's limited, it's only used in, uh, in key uh, sectors and in key countries where there are imperfections uh, in the availab availability of, uh, of private credit. So what are those, what are those other 2%, less than 2% of, uh, of exports where Exim Bank is, uh, is useful and has a role? One is you've heard a lot about is, is small, you know, small and medium-sized businesses that, um, that um, uh, find a need for export credit assistance. Now, uh, I know something about starting a small business and running a small business. I've done it myself and I've spent a lot of time with firms who, do small who, who start uh, uh, and operate small businesses. It's kind of daunting. We have a small business administration, by the way, who does that for hundreds of thousands of, of small businesses. Exporting as a small and medium-sized business is orders of magnitude more daunting. It's incredibly difficult as a small and medium-sized business, and, and, and you, you'll hear some criticism that a 10 or 20 or $30 million firm isn't a small business. It is a small business. In, the global, uh, 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 in a global market, it is a tiny business, all right? And it is daunting for a firm of that size to try to find its place in the market, to learn how to do it, to deal with uh, market risk, credit risk, market research, finding customers, logistics, dealing with um, uh, you know, uh, delivery and the needs of, uh, of consumers in a global market, and where do you start, and which country, and how do you hedge uh, risk. Getting help on all of that for small and medium-sized firms is a useful role for, for XM, and it's something that, he do that it does. Another big role for XM is that you hear a lot about, and it's where a lot of the criticism is, is where XM fits in, uh, in assisting uh, the, uh, the buyers of uh, large firms, right? So the GEs, the Boeings, and why and how uh, that's necessary. We could spend a lot of time uh, discussing that. I assume that we will do that uh, today and get into, into greater, um, uh, greater depth and discussion about it. But let me just say, there are, um, there are markets, largely uh, emerging and developing markets, where um, the customers are seeking to purchase very large, expensive, capital-intensive goods and services that require long lead times for development and, for, um, and to manufacture and deliver to the market. Right? So these are really, really unique um, kinds of things in really, really unique markets where the customer demands not just export credit assistance, but official export credit assistance for needs that we can, that we can go into and, um, uh, and, and try to understand why that is. Now you might, say, you might ask, why is that, is that, is that still useful, uh, you know, is that useful for, for XM to do that? I would say uh, it is uh, in those markets. The alternative, the alternative to not having uh, export credit assistance available for those products in those markets is to say that we are closing those markets to those, uh, to those U.S. exporters. That they may not sell in, uh, in emerging and developing economies, large capital intensive goods that require long lead times and long, term, long terms for, um, uh, for financing. You might still say that might not be uh, useful uh, if it came at a cost to taxpayers, but it doesn't come at a cost to taxpayers. And in fact, of all the problems that we've got in this country right now, the fact that we're sitting here debating the existence of an agency that, that sends a billion dollars a year, a large part of it, by the way, being paid by foreigners, to the Treasury means that we are really um, uh, uh, misprioritizing uh, our concerns right now. There are a lot bigger concerns we have than agencies that make money for the taxpayer and send it to the Treasury by drawing a lot of those resources from, uh, from foreign countries. So I know we'll get into greater depth in all of those uh, all of those points. Look forward to it. Look forward to Ben's, Tim's, and your questions. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we'll certainly get into one of the questions I'll have for you, for both of you, is the notion uh, of that profit and whether it's an accounting fiction or a reality. And I'm sure Tim will probably get into that. Uh, so let's hear from Tim. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you guys all 
all came out on a, a good summer night. Sometimes it's hard to get people to give up their, their lovely summer nights, but Export-Import Bank is a scintillating enough topic, apparently, <laughs> to do it. Um, first thing I want to make clear is uh, there is no AEI position on Exim. Mm -hmm. I do not speak for the institution as a 501c3 nonprofit institution, you, you know, all that stuff. We don't actually take positions on the policies, but I do. And <laughs> Export Import Bank is a government agency that uses taxpayer money to subsidize foreign companies that buy goods from American companies with a majority of that money subsidizing goods from the five biggest U.S. exporters. That is a factual description of the Export-Import Bank. And if you're a believer in free enterprise, if you're a believer in fairness, if you're a believer in capitalism, I think that constitutes a very strong argument against Export-Import Bank. And the argument is on three levels, at least. I think it's a moral argument. I think it's an economic argument. And it's also a political argument. On a moral level, it's Robin Hood in reverse. It's wrong to make taxpayers bear the risk for sales that large corporations are making to large corporations, many of whom are government owned overseas. So two, very, two parties that are very good at taking care of themselves, with the other middleman often being large banks. I love large US corporations. I love large US banks. I love the fact that large foreign corporations are willing to do business with us. I don't think taxpayers should be forced to bear the risk for this. The other half of the moral argument, though, is the moral hazard, is that when government gets involved in this sort of thing, it creates an opportunity for cronyism and corruption. I don't think most of what Exim does involves cronyism or corruption, but I do think that it's, it pops up in Exim's dealings because when government is in the position to pick winners or losers, not only does it pick the wrong people, it often picks its own people. But the economic argument is basically the argument that the government cannot make money out of nowhere. The government cannot enhance the efficiency of the economy in most situations because what it's doing is it's allocating resources from what the market would choose towards what the politicians and the bureaucrats choose. And you see this across the board. You have uh, economists of all stripes saying, in general, the government cannot, through export subsidies, create wealth. You have the American Action Forum, which is in fact, generally a supporter of the Export-Import Bank, saying it doesn't actually create jobs in the US economy. It allocates jobs around the US economy. You have the GAO and the Congressional Research Service and economists like Milton Friedman, again, saying supporting our exporting industry can help players in the export market at the expense of the rest of the economy. So Exim creates jobs in some parts of the economy but broadly destroys jobs in the others with a net cost. It's an economic argument. And the political argument is that the defense of free markets often is caricatured by the left as being, this is just a defense of big business and you know, corporate America. And I don't think that's true of the defense of free markets. But sometimes it is true when it comes to what politicians argue for. And the best way to show that the defense of free markets is, in fact, a defense of free and open competition as a moral position and as a position that maximizes national wealth, the best way to show that is for the believers in free enterprise to stand up and fight against corporate welfare. And the best way to stand up and fight against corporate welfare today is to wind down the Export-Import Bank. Very good presentations from uh, both you guys. I want to start with you, Tim. And it always seems to me in reading all of the uh, criticisms of the Export-Import Bank and the defenses of it, the strongest defense is always, why would we unilaterally disarm when uh, you certainly have the Chinese who are not going to do that and in aggregate do a whole lot more ECA than we do? Uh, the Europeans obviously are not going to stop doing it for Airbus. Uh, so why? Uh, unless you have a broader context of some global trade uh, normalization in which you remove mm -hmm. this in other uh, leading uh, economies that we're competing against, why would the U.S. want to unilaterally disarm, even if you are, in fact, helping, uh, for the most part, a small group of very big companies? Uh, yeah, and I'm very familiar with the argument that you know, Europe is doing this, because I'm very familiar with it, because I have five children. And they often say, oh, well, Charlie did it first, or Lucy did it first. You know what, Charlie jumped off the top of the playset doesn't make it a good idea for you to jump off the top of the playset. The Royal Economic Society put out a study that found that China is hurting its economy by 3%, that it's reducing its 
economic output by 3% by subsidizing its exports. So China's hurting its broader economy, helping some of its exporters, yes, but hurting its broader economy, and we're supposed to emulate that? No, I don't think we ought to emulate the way that China approaches industrial policy. And when we do it in response, it's not ultimately, it still doesn't make sense. Just because China's rigging the game doesn't mean it makes sense for us to rig the game too. The economic facts are still there. Subsidies can reward a portion of the economy while hurting the rest of the economy. And the fact is that the, the specific businesses affected by this are not going to go out of business. They're not going to put Boeing out of business. Does, does Europe's aircraft subsidies hurt Boeing? Yes. I hate that. WTO can try, the US or the WTO can try to reduce that. But until we do, it's still advantageous for us to leave it up to the free enterprise rather than counter subsidize Boeing because that would be us hurting ourselves just like Europe is hurting themselves. What about that, Tony Prado? The idea that uh, if you unilaterally disarm, you're not actually harming the US economy or, in fact, uh, US companies, including Boeing? You're not for, for a, a number of reasons. Not the, the least of which is that it's not actually a subsidy, right? I mean, the uh, XM financing is actually at market rates, and there's lots of great analysis uh, on this, and con you know, uh, could some of it by some of the critics, who unwittingly, uh, I'm not sure understood what they were what they were essentially proving, but uh, the rates that are charged by OECD export credit. Um, uh, agencies, which is what we're largely talking about, so not, so not China and not India, who are in a race to the bottom and, um, and are, are charging below market rates on, on lots of their financing, is actually the market rate. So the market rate for financing a large infrastructure project in Africa uh, is a rate that includes uh, export credit assistance by lots of agencies uh, somewhere. That's the market rate. So we're charging a market rate. We're charging an OECD um, uh, rate. We're charging a WTO compliant rate. There is no, if you would, um, uh, say, you know, if you, if you think the United States should bring a WTO case against um, uh, Airbus, you can't because uh, it's, an, it's a WTO compliant uh, rate. The, 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 the rates charged for expert credit assistance are governed by an agreement at the OECD by OECD uh, participant countries. So the rate is the rate. That is the market rate. It is true that China and India and others are, uh, who are non-OECD countries are, um, uh, are out financing at rates below uh, the OECD rate, which only acts to make the OECD rate actually more expensive uh, relative to the market. So, uh, so it is a market rate. There is, no, uh, there, there is no subsidy there. I wouldn't support um, uh, a subsidy. I don't think we. Uh, I don't think we should, and I think that's that's not that's not even what we're seeing. But it, it is a subsidy. It's a subsidy by the normal definition of the word, which is government providing funds to assist a business. It's a subsidy by the WTO definition of the word, which again is government providing a service to assist a business. Now, the only way it's not a subsidy is if you take first the accounting definition of the word, but then take bad accounting. You take the way that the Export Import Bank does its own, and you referred to this earlier, does its own accounting is through something which was a step in the right direction decades ago, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. But you, and you use that math, but you don't take into account what the GAO says you have to, t or the CBO says you have to take into account, which is market risk. The Congressional Budget Office says that Export-Import Bank's current way of accounting does not properly take into account the costs to government of running XSIM which is to say the actual full uh, panoply of risks. And so if you do that, Export-Import Bank is providing a subsidy, especially on the loan guarantees, of, to the score of $2 billion a decade to the subsidized companies. And so by the standard definition of subsidy, by the WTO definition <laughs> of subsidy, and by fair market, counting, fair market accounting, 
it's a subsidy. Yeah, I want to get into that fair market accounting issue specifically. Absolutely, uh, I'd love because, to. Because it, it, it seems like the one of the more contentious points of you know, the argument may, often made in favor of Vexim is why would we even be talking about this? It provides a billion dollars a year to the taxpayer at no cost and almost no risk. Uh, as Tim said, uh, you can make the argument if you base it on the real market risk that mm -hmm. Exim faces, uh, it is a cost and a subsidy. Absolutely. So, so first of all, this um, um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, FICRA, uh, accounting that Exim uses uh, is the accounting that the U.S. government uses and that we commonly use for budgeting, right? This isn't some exotic uh, form of accounting. It's when we have those debates annually about taxing and spending and how much we need to um, uh, take in, in dollars from real people in the economy to pay for government spending, that's the accounting that we use for across government. So there's nothing unique to, uh, to Exim about it. It is the accounting of the U.S. government for its, um, for its balance sheet. Um, fair value accounting, um, I'm a huge advocate of fair value accounting. We should absolutely always uh, think about, uh, about fair value accounting. And if you're unfamiliar with it, what it in shorthand is, as you know, Tim talked about uh, market risk, is the concept that um, when, you know, that any asset, right, that's held, it needs to be somehow marked to market. If it's held, um, you need to think about over time what the market risk for it. For, fred for federal credit, it's a, it's a particular problem because of the way governments access capital. So you want to think about um, you want to think about market risk. What's built into the cost of lots of um, lots of credit is uh, you might have currency risk in there, and certainly Exim thinks about political risk and country risk and lots of other kinds of um, uh, operational risk. Um, and the CBO's question is whether they is whether they uh, consider uh, market risk. Now, I personally have a view on 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 Exim's um, on Exim's um, ways of estimating. Risk, and I think they actually do a pretty good job of it, right? But doing uh, using fair value accounting to uh, to try to uh, determine market risk, um, uh, like I said, it's great to do in uh, in lots of markets. It's particularly difficult to do with uh, with Exim. Here's the reason: if you understand the Federal Accounting Standing Board's definition for estimating market risk, you have to go out and take an asset and put it into a rich market uh, and try to find out what the exit price is of that asset. You need to find a buyer who will pay a price to, to take either that asset or the transfer the liability to, to, to put a price on it. That's how you determine market risk. It's not what you would do to create it. It's, what, it's how you would determine it uh, in selling it. It's really, really hard to do with assets and liabilities that might be a power plant in Ghana or an infrastructure project in Peru. They're, these are not places where you can easily exit the asset and transfer the liability and try to determine a price. So what did CBO do? CBO tried to model the price of market risk. It took, uh, it looked at assets that have the same uh, default rate as assets at, uh, that uh, XM financing does and said, okay, same default rate, let's use that uh, price to estimate uh, to estimate market risk. Now, I know that you can have an asset in in Peru that has uh, a default um, um, rate of default, and you can have um, you know DC government uh, with an asset that has a default rate. They could be the identical default rate and have two different prices. But let's just set that aside and assume that CBO did the best in its crude analysis that it can do. It did this for one year. It multiplied by 10, and it came up with the number that, uh, that, that Tim came up with. But if you unpack that and look at what, they, what, what ex exactly did they find in that, in that cost, what they found was that in Exim's direct loans, even using fair value accounting, the direct loans from, um, uh, from Exim are, slightly, are charged slightly more expensive than the market accounting for market risk. So all of you have been written writing that Exim makes cheap loans. They actually make expensive loans. CBO found, or, uh, actually uh, uh, determined using their crude uh, method that um, uh, the CBO makes expensive uh, expensive loans. Using that method, they found that uh, they determined they made slightly less expensive um, uh, guarantees and uh, and insurance. And because Exim does 
more guarantees and insurance, uh, they found a slight uh, subsidy cost using that crude method that, uh, that CBO did. I look at it and say, actually, what the, the rate that they found overall on net was about uh, one half of 1% uh, subsidy. Not, real, uh, not a huge subsidy and not really big over time given the crude method that they did. I said, use, take a look at fair value accounting. Use it if you want to perfect the pricing at XM. And that would be a very useful way to use XM to try to better perfect the pricing so that you account for, uh, for market risk all the way through it. And hopefully they would do a much better and much more sophisticated analysis than their back of the envelope um, work that they sent up to Chairman Henserlin. Uh, Tim, if you want to get back into the accounting question, uh, you're welcome to do that or respond to anything that, uh, that Tony said on uh, the CBO and how it came up with those numbers. But I wanted to ask you more broadly on the government's role in uh, uh, you know, the marketplace and in assisting U.S. companies. Would you say Exim should go and the SBA should also go? We shouldn't have a small business administration. We shouldn't have any programs in place that, uh, whether you say they pick winners or losers, I don't know, but in some form assist uh, smaller companies that without that assistance couldn't be as competitive? Well, first, the XM is predominantly assists big companies. And the the 80 percent, more than 80 percent of XM subsidies go to large companies. And they're congressionally required to uh, spend 20 percent of their subsidies on small businesses. It, last year they didn't meet that, they got 19%. The average over the last 10 years is about 19%. And that's even with a definition of small business that is somewhere between the, you can have 499 employers and be a small business, and in some industries you can have 1,499 employers, uh, employees and still be a small business. So just on the XM question, they're not primarily supporting small business. The fact that there is a small business administration is, for me, another argument that would make it easier for us to ease out of XM. Because I know that government agencies that shouldn't exist, government programs that shouldn't exist, often sort of set up an infrastructure in which there's an expectation and there can be transition costs out of it. One of the big transition costs out of X, one of the big transitions out of XM can be that some of these small business recipients will have access to small business administration subsidies. But even there, I'm bothered by the small businesses that XM subsidizes because, yes, it's good to make to for our small businesses to compete well and to have a profit. But when you subsidize this exporter of bottled water or this exporter of widgets, then there's another exporter of widgets or another producer of widgets who just sells them domestically who doesn't get that subsidy. And they are at a disadvantage when it comes to you know trying to buy the parts or buy the machinery to make those widgets. They all get put at a competitive disadvantage. So again, the subsidies, whether it's Small Business Administration or Export Import Bank, they help to subsidize companies, but often at the expense of other US companies. So I'm, I'm not an expert in small business administration. I don't know enough about how they do it. But to the degree that government picks winners and losers and says, these guys who are able to fill out this government paperwork or who hire the right lobbies, they get a subsidy and we help them. We always have to remember, for every beneficiary of a subsidy program, there are victims. And they're not always easy to see. Because it's a guy who didn't get the loan. He would have gotten the loan, but somebody else had an XM or an SBA guarantee. Or it's a guy who's just doing his own business, he would have expanded, but you know what? He was competing, trying to get you know the pickling jars, and his pickle competitor was able to pay less for the pickling jars, or was able to better finance it because she had subsidy. So I mean, again, I'm not an expert in the SBA. The reason I make Export-Import Bank a priority is it's picking one sector of the economy, favoring it, probably helping that sector of the economy, but at the expense of the rest of the economy. Uh, Tony, one thing that um, I think outrages most people when they, well, I shouldn't say most people ever dig into the XM issue <laughs> because most people don't. And, you know, they're God all in this room. For, for not yes. doing it. Yeah, all of you. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, though, uh, and Chuck Lane had a piece uh, on, in the Washington Post that, that mentioned this. You look at the XM Bank and its assistance to Boeing and its guaranteeing loans to, uh, you know, petro giants like Dubai. Why on earth would a a uh, country with enormous resources who can easily buy Boeing planes without any support from the U.S. government uh, be getting uh, basic underwriting assistance from the United States government. It seems to be a pretty outrageous proposition. Well, look, 
Um, you know, it's like uh, it's like saying you know, if I walk into a store, right, and I want to buy a product and it has a price on it, but I can afford to pay more, so I should pay more for it, right? I mean, like it's, there's there is the price for a product that um, uh, it, if we want to talk about if we want to talk about airplanes, like here's here's what the world looks like. Um, the demand over the next 25 years for airplanes is in emerging markets. It's, it's almost it's almost a vertical line of demand. Right? Like you can sell into it from now and for the next 25 years. Not just for international flights, but you know, Chinese um, uh, airlines flying within China, within India, within Brazil. The, the, the volume of uh, air traffic is going to increase as these uh, markets continue to develop. What they are, whatever you want to call them, are customers. And they've got choices. Right? So their choices are for, uh, in the case of wide body airplanes, two. Right, we talk about, like we call Boeing names. Boeing's only competitor in the world was created out of whole cloth uh, by a number of countries in Europe, subsidized by them, favored by them, and back with um, uh, a, a massive war chest from four different countries with ample export credit. We're talking about Airbus. And we're talking about Airbus, right? That's, th that's Boeing's competitor in the world for wide body aircraft, right? And we call Boeing names, right? Now, what Boeing does is go out and try to build really great uh, airplanes. Uh, Airbus, actually, with all of that assistance, actually builds really good airplanes, too. I prefer the Boeing airplanes, but I've ridden on Airbus planes, and they're, 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 fine, um, they're fine planes, too. The buyers of them, in the, cons the customers in, uh, in these markets, all overwhelmingly emerging markets in developing, uh, in developing economies, uh, require export credit assistance, and not just any kind of export credit assistance, but um, uh, official export credit assistance for a whole myriad of reasons. The least important reason, by the way, is price. Because as I've established, the price is set by the OECD. There is no competition on the price of, uh, of XM financing for airplanes. Right? There is no competition by XM and the Europeans on the price for financing these airplanes. If you take XM away, it's an easy call for Emirates or anyone else because they'll be left with one company that is providing the financing at a rate set by the OECD. This is a no-brainer. You want to let Boeing show up at this pitch to sell airplanes without the one thing that the customer demands, which is official export credit assistance, and say, no thanks, Boeing, uh, I mean, sorry, Airbus is your, um, uh, is your choice. No choice in the world but Airbus. Yeah. That, that's a I, good point for you to I, I, Maybe I have uh, more confidence in Boeing than you do, Tony, but I think they make airplanes that are much better, um, and I talk to airline executives and they say yes there are things for which they need Boeing and they can't buy Airbus now all airlines now are moving to a situation where they want to have a mixed portfolio for a variety of reasons they don't want to be dependent on one company they don't they uh, have have different needs and different hauling and and different companies have their different virtues so every airline will continue to buy the, the bigger airlines will continue to buy Airbus and Boeing but Boeing doesn't think it's going to lose all these sales when XM goes away. And other people don't think they're going to lose all these sales when XM goes away. This is a chart I found on, a, on Boeing's website. And you, can't re you might be able to see it. It's these different lines are uh, different level ways of getting financing for export. Green means really good. Yellow means OK. Red means there's not a lot of financing there. And it goes over time. And you see in the, in the financial downturn, there's a lot of red. But looking ahead into 2014, every line is green. Leasing companies, commercial banks, capital markets, private equity and hedge funds, tax equity, new sources of funding, airframe and engine manufacturers. That one's yellow. Oh, the one red one, export credit agencies. XM and these others that have to dial down because of, of recent trade agreements. So you see one form of financing, the government, dialed down. The others all dial up, 
it suggests that when government steps out of the business of financing these airplanes, others step up. And Goldman Sachs this week had a report on the aerospace and defense industry. And what they found was, quote, if the US Export-Import Bank charter is not renewed, we believe the overall impact in the near to, mid, in near to medium term would be fairly limited given the robust financing environment at present. It would only require a small step up from each of the many other sources of financing airplanes to fill an XM gap. They described a marginal impact on otherwise very strong existing backlog and order trends. In other words, Boeing can still sell jets without Export Import Bank. Will they lose some sales? Yes. It will be a fraction, a small fraction of the 18% of sales that they now get subsidized by Export Import Bank. They will do well because they make better airplanes, because fleets, because uh, airlines want to have a mixture of financing, and because now of all times, financing for airplanes is great. And so that means now is the perfect time, especially with the record backlog that Boeing is enjoying right now. They have the highest ever backlog of orders of planes. This is a perfect time to help transition out of these subsidies and into an actual free market for aircraft financing. I think, uh, Tony, S&P had a similar report that showed a limited impact on the near term, but, near term. Uh, but in a but in medium, longer term, um, definitely a hit, I think, is what S&P showed. And, uh, and also, and look, the market reacted on, <laughs> has, has reacted numerous times to these kinds of, um, these kinds of, of uh, problems. But, you know, look, I know Boeing's hearing it from its, uh, from its customers. I mean, it's not, it is not Boeing who is, who is um, demanding export credit assistance? It's the customers. Like this whole this, this this whole question is like, does Boeing need it? But Boeing does. It's not a question of whether Boeing needs it. It's a question of whether customer needs it. And part of the response to this is to whether can Boeing can Boeing uh, use and other companies in the in the absence of uh, export credit assist of of, uh, of uh, uh, in the absence of XM use some of their own financing resources. Well. I mean, it's possible that they can, through difficult times, uh, you know, bridge periods. Yeah, that's that's possible. But industrial companies don't have a comparative advantage in banking. They're not interested in becoming banks. If the answer is that um, that these that these firms should become banks, that's kind of a weird burden to place on on industrial uh, companies. I'll say one other thing though. But if your position is that that the private sector will fill that gap of XM, then this whole notion of misallocated resources in the aggregate economy is, is gone. There is no misallocation of resources. If your answer is that, if the, that the private sector and other resources will step in and fill this hole for all of these exports, there is no misallocation of resources. The same resources will go to the same places. And, and then so there's no economic uh, argument to be made. You can't have it both ways. I, I said there would be a very small reduction, I think, in, in Boeing sales. And a lot of those are sales Boeing would have had if Airbus wasn't getting the subsidies it has. But still, when that financing will go to undertakings that the market finds to be more economically rewarding. Right now, some of that is going to the Exim subsidized companies, not just Boeing and not just the big guys, but a lot of the small guys. And we are letting Exim board of governors decide where the money goes instead of letting thousands of small financiers make their own decision and let them go where the money goes. I have more faith in the market than I do in bureaucrats, and that's why I think. That's a, but this, this, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. A, the, the, but this whole this whole notion of like that that it, I mean, if export is Exim is there as a service to, to anyone who exports, right. right? Anyone who exports, as long as I mean, I will say in the United States, you got really stringent. Um, uh, standards for using XM. You have to deal with, you know, the highest X um, uh, domestic content requirements in the world. You have to do the only ECA in the world that has to do uh, economic impact analysis. Um, that you know, there 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 are requirements that 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 we have that uh, that others don't have. But this notion that if you use XM, that you're somehow uh, getting some special privilege. It's it's like it's, it's like if you build a port in Baltimore, right? That that's some special privilege to to exporters because they've got a port and it was built with a tax um, uh, supported municipal financing and they've got a municipal uh, ports commission. It's the same thing. It's a yeah. it's a but port. It's a very legitimate question yeah. whether they're really picking winners and losers if everybody has equal access to uh, XM services. You, it's not like you've got a bureaucrat going out there saying you get it, you get it, you get it, you don't. 
there's, there's a great way to support exports, which is, and to support American manufacturers, which is to reform our tax code. I mean, you know, Tony, our, you and, and, and you, you do good work on this. Our high tax rates put us at a disadvantage. Our tax complexity put us at a disadvantage. Regulations put us at a disadvantage. And reforming all of those things will broadly both encourage exports, encourage manufacturing, whether it's exporting or not, but an agency that subsidizes 2%, as you pointed out, 2% of all US exports. And it involves the companies, either the buyers or the financers or the sellers, coming and dealing with the Washington bureaucracy. That's an agency that's picking winners and losers. And my favorite thing on the Exxon website is this map of every congressional district. Now, every congressional district has some Exxon beneficiary. That's a sign to me that this is politically motivated. We've had, these, we've had corruption cases where insiders get things to their friend. Those are vast minority. It's not, it's not most of the deals. But you also have where Exim picks, oh, well, women minority-owned districts or green energy. And Solyndra, as it was failing and threatening to default on its Department of Energy loan guarantee, got an Exim loan guarantee. So you just have to ask, this is picking winners and losers. If it's only going to 2% of exporters, not only is it not helping other exporters, it's putting the other US exporters at a disadvantage as compared to, as an alternative to, tax and regulatory reform, which could help all exporters. So we're uh, running close to time for some audience Q&A, but I want to do one thing before that, and just in brief answers, uh, to put on your prognosticator caps a little bit. Uh, a, what do you see as the likely outcome of this debate? Uh, do we get reauthorization? Uh, how do we get it? Is it through a CR, some other mechanism? Uh, and B, if we don't, if Exim goes away on the October 1, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What does the world look like? What happens uh, on October 1 if we don't have it? And just like two minutes. <laughs> I'll do, uh, le less than two minutes. I think, uh, <laughs> okay. I think, uh, I think uh, eventually it will, get, uh, it will get reauthorized and it'll be a full reauthorization. It'll be a five-year uh, reauthorization. And uh, I think there's some, a lot of uh, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who are working pretty hard uh, at, that, at that goal. In the near term, might have to be, be part of a, uh, uh, a CR in, in the short term because Congress is doing nothing at the moment. Um, however, if that's the case, and already it's the case, we've heard it from some uh, individual uh, uh, exporters, uh, they're already losing some, uh, some opportunities, and I think you're going to see that more and more in the coming months as you get, as you get closer to, um, to October 1st, or if it's extended uh, in a CR as you near the end of the, uh, of okay, the CR. Okay, and if it's not, what, what would happen if it goes away? It's not going to go away. So you, you're not even willing to entertain the notion uh, uh, of, it's not, of Boeing it's, filing, filing for Chapter 11 the day after uh, <laughs> the accident goes away. Uh, but um, no, I mean, uh, it, it, look, if, if it would go, if it, if it would go away for, for companies like Boeing, it's not good. It's there. There will be cost. There'll be near-term cost, but it'll be a slow um, uh, and, and I think a pretty lengthy. What you know, what you see a pretty lengthy um, uh, capture of the market by uh, by Airbus. I mean, you just be giving Airbus a a huge advantage that Airbus will absolutely take advantage of, and customers on the other end will, will in more cases than not, have no choice but to uh, accept um, uh, uh, Airbus and its, and its uh, availability of financing. And Tim, do you think the reform conservative movement has the uh, energy and the uh, commitment to this to see it through to the end. Uh, I mean, it's gotten close a couple times, mm -hmm. closer to the last time, uh, yeah. but that is the conventional wisdom, and, and everybody I talk to shares it, that it will get uh, reauthorized. What it's, do you think is going to happen, and B, if it went away, what would happen? It's really hard to beat it because it's what economists describe as concentrated benefits, diffuse costs. That the annual cost of Exim right now is, is nearly negligible to the average taxpayer, and the average benefit, I think, is, is fairly small to most exporters, but to some exporters, it's a big deal, and they are lobbying hard to save it. And so, you know, it, none of you guys, despite how convinced you are by my arguments, ought to go out and bet about on Exim ending. But if Exim did end, if the Republicans looked around and realized that standing up for free enterprise across the board was beneficial, and they used their power, either the filibuster in the Senate or the majority in the House, to kill it, I think what you would see would be some short-term disruptions. But first of all, if Exim ended all current promise financing continues. Second of all, Boeing, again, with a, uh, a record backlog, would be able to weather the storm. And in the long run, their portion of the market, right now they're 50-50, I think they would drop. And I think we would work like crazy in WTO to end their Airbus subsidies. 
I think the economy as a whole would gain. And I, I mean, the CRS study I, I was reading earlier today, most economists doubt that a nation can improve its welfare over the long run by subsidizing exports. Subsidized export financing merely shifts production f among sectors within the economy. You find this, again, the American Action Forum I pointed to, I, uh, economists Kyle Bagwell, Robert Segler said, such policies at best introduce a costly domestic distortion to the economy, at worst cause a deterioration of terms in trade. So in other words, yes, Boeing would suffer from the end of XM, not disastrously, and the rest of the economy would have a small gain, and the rest of the com country overall would benefit. This is one of these debates where um, I can truly say that I'm uh, non-ideological and, and non-partisan because I absolutely have no idea which uh, of these guys is right uh, uh, overall. I'm sure people in the room have stronger feelings about it than I do. And I, I was hoping to come out of this with uh, you know, an absolute feeling that, yeah, Tony's right, yeah, Tim's right. Uh, I don't have that. Maybe some of you do. Um, but you probably have good questions uh, for these guys, so I want to open it up to the audience, the experts in the audience. You just identify who you are before you talk, and then uh, no speeches, just quick questions, please. <laughs> right, now. right in the front. Uh, uh, do we have mics? Yeah, mics are coming. Okay. Just want to say a really good debate. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And um, my name is Sahan. I'm interning this summer at a startup venture capital fund here in DC. I'm originally from the University of Iowa in Iowa City. So uh, my question is, it's actually a two-part question. So the fir uh, first part of it, I'll uh, 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 joke and answer. So certainly the Ex Exim Bank has been a lot of, uh, has gotten a lot of criticism, especially due to the corruption in it. Certainly there's been a lot of bribery and all that going on and favoritism towards uh, some companies uh, in, in certain areas, in certain sectors. So uh, is it fair to say that um, uh, by having, uh, having this much favoritism, it will stifle innovation and exports by other companies because the Exim Bank is favoring one or two or five or six big companies and other companies again disadvantaged because they're not getting this subsidy? Uh, and is it fair to say that Exim Bank is stifling innovation because of that? And also, uh, my second part of the question, I would like to ask Ben, so if, if you... He's Tony, I'm Tim. Yeah, He's Ben. I'm oh, no joke. Sorry, I, I got confused. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so uh, my, my second part of the question is, um, if, um, if, you, if you believe that uh, the government sector should not give subsidies to the private sector, are you for getting rid of all government sub subsidies, that, which includes energy, banking, and many, many subsidies that are uh, given to the private sector? Are you for getting rid of all, all subsidies, period, and letting a peer free market system decide? You and that's, that a that's right. the second part of the question, and I apologize for the name. That's, that's quite all right. Um, you want to hit the first part of that? Yeah, d t two parts on it. And, and, and on this point, on, on uh, subject, no, I th actually, I think it would not be fair to say <laughs> to, <laughs> to, uh, to say uh, pretty much uh, pretty much all of that. Uh, look, on, on, on this question of the subject, I think we have to take this very, very uh, seriously and understand this. My, my, um, uh, it, my subsidy uh, for AEI's uh, 501c3 status is a greater subsidy than Exim's direct loan program, even using CBO's uh, fair value accounting analysis, right? They've got a negative subsidy, right? A negative subsidy on their direct on their direct loan programs. I actually think a better analysis would show that it's a negative subsidy across the whole range of the program. So there is no, in my, I will assert this, there is no subsidy, and I think that is a reason why this idea of you know of uh, the analysis of whether we are merely shifting resources is actually incorrect because we are actually taking a lot of the, those resources from outside of the U.S. economy and bringing it to the United States to support it. In fact, I think it's more accurate to say that foreigners are subsidizing the United States than the other way around. And so there is a positive uh, economic uh, benefit. On the, on the, on the, the question of corruption, um, and Tim mentioned it and, and mentioned it, I think, in the right way. That, look, I, I, think, I think anywhere you, you put uh, money and programs and human beings uh, together, you have the opportunity for uh, uh, for temptation and corruption. It's always it's always going to be there. You're going to see it in lots of places where you have commercial uh, transactions. My experience sitting in the offices of finance ministers um, and trade ministers in up to 40 I've been in 60 countries in the world. 40 of them are probably developing countries. A lot of them want 
uh, it, um, uh, official export credit in their in their transactions. The reason they want one of the reasons they want uh, official export credit uh, in their uh, in their transactions is to be a force against corruption, right? Because they know an official credit uh, agency has an inspector general, it has oversight. It's got um, uh, reporting that has to do to official authorities. It's got standards that it has to meet. It has to do additional testing. It has all of these things to do. And so what you find out is in these countries that they want official export credit in these mega projects, really big projects, as a force against a problem that they know that they may have in their own economy, which is the potential for, um, is the potential for corruption. Exim is a force against corruption understood that way it is on net a force against uh against corruption in uh in these deals and in these in these countries if you are in those countries an official in those countries you want and it's not just xm by the way right it's the, the, the other export credit agencies have a lot of the very same uh reporting and oversight uh requirements and they they are also as sought after by a lot of de developing countries for the very same reason i want to respond to the idea that i mean again the idea that this isn't a subsidy, the idea that this is profitable, is is kind of baffling in a couple ways. First of all, if it's profitable, the market should be doing it. I think uh, you work with banks, I know banks, you work with banks, but there's one thing banks are good at, it's seeking out profitable undertakings and financing them. I think that the banks can do it to the degree it's profitable. But second of all, I'm also familiar with that argument because I followed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for a decade, and they didn't cost the taxpayers money until they did, and then they blew up, and it, it ended up costing the taxpayers plenty. And so the idea that we have a government agency that does something profitable sort of makes no sense on both sides of the coin. But on, on the corruption angle, I think it's the, the term we Catholics use is a near occasion of sin. Whenever government is involved in parceling out money, it creates an opportunity for corruption. And sometimes it's absolutely necessary. You have to have regulators in some places. You, you have patents. You have all this stuff. And every time, it's a near occasion of sin. And sometimes you can avoid it, and sometimes you can't. When it comes to subsidizing our exports, I think this is an occasion that we can avoid, that we can depoliticize the economy and move the power away from the political sector and towards the market. I think you sort of answered the second part of that question um, uh, earlier, so I want to uh, keep yeah. it moving on. Other folks uh, we've got right here in the front. Uh, here. You're coming from your right. <laughs> coming behind, uh, you. behind you. Behind you. Behind you. Behind you. <laughs> uh, good evening, and thank you for the discussion. My name is Steve Powell. I'm the uh, managing director of Sino Powell Capital. Uh, you all know what capital is, and I'm Powell. And Sino is a prefix meaning China. So we've worked in over 30 countries around the world, including all the countries you've mentioned. And oftentimes we come up against countries that are subsidizing their own exports. That's what we compete mm -hmm. against, and we usually get burnt. It just happened in South Africa, where the Chinese walked away with a large locomotive order that GE, who got part of it, probably deserved. I have two questions. Number one, um, given your criticisms, Tim, of uh, Exim Bank, how did you respond to the U.S. government's bailout of Wall Street? That's my first question. The second question is, instead of dismantling or not authorizing Exim Bank and doing away with it, what are the three suggestions you might have to improve it and help it get uh, reauthorized? Thank you. Thank you. And again, on the score of competing against uh, subsidized uh, financing, Yes, China does this, and China hurts itself by doing it. The three, two economists from the London School of Economics writing for the Royal Economic Society found that China would increase its GDP by 3% if it got rid of its exporter financing. We, thankfully, have smaller exporter financing than China, so we don't have as much of an upside by get, getting rid of ours, but we would. And the fact that some of our exporters lose is upsetting, but the, that doesn't justify our hurting the rest of our economy to sort of make things right and settle a score. On the, uh, the question of what sort of, uh, sorry, the reform question was your second. What was your first Wall one? Street. Wall Street. Wall Street bailout. Oh, I, I did not like the Wall Street bailout. I didn't necessarily, I'm not ideologically opposed to government involvement. I thought the Wall Street bailout uh, too much was directed at saving the existing firms and should have been just more generally aimed at, uh, 
at saving the economy. Tony and I, it's another thing we disagree on. Um, <laughs> but the final, the final thing is that the, uh, what recommendations would I make if we weren't going to end it? Um, I have uh, friends here from Heritage Action, and I know that they don't necessarily like you know, uh, negotiating with yourself, but I, I try to answer the question. So um, first of all, I would dramatically limit the number of authorizations they're allowed to do. It was $27 billion last year. I would cut it way down. And then XM would be forced to find the deals where they think they're having, uh, having the biggest impact. Second, I would stop doing things no, I have trouble coming up with the other ones because every other year they do uh, they do reforms and they don't work. You know, we subsidize a foreign steel plant and they say no more subsidizing foreign manufacturers that compete with ours. And so then we subsidize a Chinese uh, semiconductor plant and then we subsidize the richest woman in Australia who owns you know a, an iron ore mine. And then we subsidize a GE factory in Mexico where the guys go and do a job that they used to do in Bloomington, Indiana. So all these little reforms, they never end up working out. Any reforms that I would approve as a halfway measure involve dramatically shrinking the agency way down to where it is, whether that was only doing small business loans until they could transition that over to another government agency. That would be one thing. Or if they could uh, just document that these are this is financing that the other guys are only going to win because they have foreign export subsidies. And that's not because I think that's a good reason to subsidize those exports, just because I think that would be a way to get more Republicans on, on the bill. What about that, Tony Prado, really quickly? Yeah. Are there reforms that you would support to XM? Well, I, I, I actually think XM has, has implemented a lot of reforms, actually, over the, ten, the past 10 to 15 years that has dramatically improved its, its performance and made it much more um, effective. I think on, on a relative basis, talking about shrinking it, on a relative basis, it, it, it's shrinking, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the global uh, trading market is um, growing by orders of magnitude. So on a relative basis, it is, in fact, shrinking. Relative to other export credit agencies, it's shrinking. They're all growing. They all have a lot more flexibility, a lot more um, resources. Um, a, lot of foreign, a lot of the foreign um, uh, export credit agencies are uh, reducing their domestic content uh, requirement. They're lowering it. Um, I, I would love to see, uh, I, actually, I, I would support uh, you know, uh, seeing that in the United States. I think there's a, that's a, probably a non-starter in Congress, unfortunately. I think uh, we're going to keep, um, uh, keep the, the very high domestic content um, uh, requirement, which is not reflective of global supply chains right now and how really complex products are built, so it's really unfortunate. So not, you know, other export credit agencies are, are um, are, are reforming themselves to make themselves actually a whole lot more uh, competitive and, uh, and able to um, uh, uh, get involved in, in transactions that the, the American uh, Export Credit Agency, XM, can't do. One thing I would think about, though, is this question, which I talked about earlier on fair value accounting, right, is to figure out ways to better perfect pricing. Because I do, th I think we should always be thinking about ways to make sure that we're accounting for risk. I do not want to see undue burden on uh, the taxpayer that isn't matched by price. I think, personally, XM is doing a pretty good job of estimating risk and, and pricing in um, risk so that it, it, it buys away any, uh, any notion of, uh, uh, of subsidy. But that's a point for, uh, for argument. And I think uh, uh, we should always be looking for uh, you know, better ways to, to uh, be a lot more sophisticated and how we uh, and how we measure risk and how we can um, and how we can account for uh, for the price of risk because like I said I'm a taxpayer I don't want to see that burden on taxpayers. We have time for one or two more. Um, I see uh, in the back corner. Hi, my name is Robert Thomas. Uh, question for both of you. There are also arguments that rather than thinking of the export import bank in purely economic terms we should think of it in kind of geopolitical strategic terms as a tool basically for cultivating relationships with various foreign actors uh, that can be used to promote U.S. interests. To what extent do each of you buy that argument? And if it's valid, uh, how much do you think we should weigh those kinds of geostrategic arguments relative to economic arguments for and against the bank? Um, on that score, first let me recommend an article by uh, my AI colleague, Tom Donnelly, who he wrote a blog post at AI and a piece at the Daily Caller recommending that. But ultimately, I do not think that XM is well equipped to carry out foreign policy. 
because it has a mission, which is to help U.S. exporters. And so we've had loan guarantees to the China National Nuclear Corporation in the same months that they were getting busted for, uh, for helping proliferate nuclear weapons materials. We are subsidizing state-owned airlines and state-owned companies all over. This is not advancing the idea of you know, free markets in other countries. This is us propping up state-owned companies. We, the, some of the same countries, companies that got sanctions, rightly so, by President Obama in Russia in the last few weeks, got XM subsidies before. Why? Because their job was to help U.S. companies. But that puts the U.S. government on the record endorsing, subsidizing these guys, no nuclear weapons proliferators, people who are propping up uh, the aggression in Russia, we're subsidizing them. This doesn't help us. I think because it's not a foreign policy tool, it actually ends up harming our foreign policy. I'm going to stipulate, I don't know if I'm going to stipulate on every time that Tim says subsidy that um, I don't think it's a subsidy. <laughs> but but we're going to stipulate that just, just for now. I, I will stipulate for the rest of our uh, discussion that I the do, record with that, yeah, that we are selling a service to overseas customers who are paying a price for it that is on subsidy. I would just stipulate that and we don't have, I don't have to come back to it again. Uh, I agree that uh, one thing you do not want is Exim Bank um, uh, Putting them, uh, giving them authority in, on, in any way on foreign policy. As Tim said, that's not their job, right? Um, the job to determine U.S. foreign policy is, is the administration and Congress working together to set U.S. foreign policy. So if uh, the administration or Congress want to order Exim Bank not to make, uh, not to finance transactions with uh, certain individuals or certain countries, it can and should do that. It has done that on a number of occasions, and on those occasions, Exim doesn't do uh, financing for those uh, companies or those countries. But it has to do it at the direction of political leadership in the country, not on its own, uh, making dis determinations as to as to um, you know who are favorable or unfavorable actors on behalf of the political leadership of the country. That's not its competency. We have time probably for one more. If there's uh, other, I see. Uh, sorry, in the back. Hi, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Uh, so I have uh, two quick questions for uh, uh, Mr. Fredo. So you mentioned that uh, uh, one of the key uh, reasons why you should why we should support Axiom is that it's supporting smaller businesses to export. But why should we support smaller business to export in the first place? If mm -hmm. they are if they grow, if they are efficient, if they can grow large, they're gonna start exporting themselves. And the second question is you saying that. Uh, uh, the uh, loan guarantee is that uh, ex export import bank gave to foreign buyers at a fair market rate. But if it's at a fair market rate, why don't these foreign buyers just go get it for another bank? Uh, why, why did it have to get an uh, export in bank? And then another question for uh, uh, Mr. Carney. So you mentioned that uh, the, one of the costs of uh, uh, team subsidy is that. Uh, if uh, one U.S. firm gets a subsidy, one another U.S. firm did not get it, then that's gonna uh, be uh, like put, put the firm that did not get it at a uh, disadvantageous place for competition. But what if? Uh, but it seems to me that the access to Exim Bank is a uh, it's generally accessible to every U.S. exporter. So that I think the cost is actually at the cost of foreign competitors. So if I take the take the example of Boeing, and yes, it's a um, uh, the competitive Boeing is at a is at disadvantage because of the XM, but that competitor is a foreign company. So, how do you think about the welfare cost? Thank you. Fast answers. Uh, on the on the first question as to why we I, I, I didn't hear I, I apologize. So you guys heard better the second question. But the first question on on why small businesses uh, look I look I I. I think Exim has a role to deal with certain imperfections in the market. One of the imperfections we have in uh, in the U.S. market is that we are not we, we are not really built for um, uh, for exporting. We have we have a we have a mismatch in financial services availability for a lot of our exports, and, and it is both the benefit and the curse of having a really really big, successful, rich um, domestic market, an internal market. You can do really really well. I my company does really, really well without even thinking about exporting, right? But if you want to export, and I think there are a lot of virtues 
uh, in exporting, giving some small business, because it's so difficult to do, and it's particularly difficult for American firms to do, um, some assistance to, to help figure out, help uh, young firms figure out how to do it, how to learn how to do it, how to get into markets, how to deal with um, all of the risks that you need uh, to do it, is really, really, uh, is, a, is a good benefit for the country. What happens with a lot of these uh, companies is actually they graduate out of Exim, and that's what you want to see, right? Where they, they, they come in and they, they figure out how to, um, uh, how to export, and we have a, you know, the tradable sector in the United States is about 12 to 15 percent, right? Really small. It, Germany is, I think, is around 60 uh, percent, right? So, like, really, you know, Japan, much larger. Really big tradable sectors. We have a small tradable sector. There are huge benefits to exports, which a lot of us uh, understand. And so, helping some small businesses try to figure out how to do that and then graduate out of um, uh, Exim and do it on, on its own is, strikes me as, you know, a reasonable uh, public policy goal. There, there's nothing inherently governmental, though, in, in what you're describing there, that uh, banks and finance companies often help it. You see these American Express uh, small business ads, are like, you have accounting that you don't want to spend your time doing accounting or compliance or payroll. We have services to do that. This is what's so amazing about the American financial sector is that we have the ability to go ahead and that, that the companies see a need and they fill it. That's what the free market's about. There are certain undertakings that are inherently governmental. And I'm not uh, advocating for a private military, and I'm not advocating for private money, although, again, maybe some of my AEI colleagues do. I don't speak for the institution. Um, but it's not inherently governmental to subsidize export. And to tie that into the answer to your question, sometimes there are competitors where one competitor competes domestically in exporting and the other just domestically. Export Import Bank puts the second one at a disadvantage in that. If he doesn't want to ex, and this also happens with smaller banks. There are smaller banks who don't want to subsidize exporting. And so Export-Import Bank drives more business towards the bigger banks that are getting involved with XM. Uh, do you guys have uh, a couple of minutes of closing statements that you want to make? You don't have to make them, but I'd be happy to have a <laughs> summation, uh, a concise summation from each of you on uh, why we uh, should and should not uh, allow the XM to continue. It, it, it may be it may be repetitive, but look, I, ju I just think, like I said, I, th I think there this is a this is a limited, targeted uh, program. It does uh, uh, increasingly very good work in some uh, key markets um, uh, in in the world and for. Uh, some key uh, uh, firms here in the United States. It's available to all um, uh, exporters and potential exporters. I encourage uh, firms to to uh, to look at it uh, and uh, and use it if they are interested in uh, uh, in exporting. And I think that as we educate uh, more people on on exactly how XM works and what the true cost to taxpayers is or isn't. Um, we're actually getting to um, uh, more support for it, and I think that's where we're going to end up is with a with a reauthorized. And by the way, I think a reauthorized and a better um, XM program. Tim, you're going to get the final word. Um, again, I just want to quote some economists here because what we're talking about again is not is is a matter that there are unseen victims. There are the people who don't get the financing, the people whose competitors get the financing, and down the line, the taxpayers. You don't see them as a, as clearly as you see the beneficiaries, because the victims are people who didn't hire a new guy. The beneficiaries are easier to see, because they're the ones holding the money. But the broad, the victims and the beneficiaries, and you weigh them against each other, and where does it go? And I think the universal view of people who study this, economists, is that it hurts the economy broadly. Again, GAO, Exim Bank programs cannot produce substantial change in the U.S. trade balance. CRS, most economists doubt that a nation can improve its welfare over the long run by subsidizing exports. London School of Economics economists at the Royal Economic Society, China, if China removed its export subsidies, China's national income would rise by 3%. The American Action Forum run by Republican economist Doug Holtz Eakin, again, not a uh, Exim opponent, but in a 2011 paper found Exim's financing may help create jobs in specific industries. However, for the economy as a whole, export financing merely redistributes jobs around the economy rather than create overall jobs. And that point's not just at an economic problem, but again, at a moral problem. 
When our government is picking winners and losers, when our government is saying, these guys deserve your financing, even if it hurts these other guys, this is corruption. And as long as Republicans are willing to stand behind government interventions, as long as they support business, they're never going to convince the American public that free enterprise is the right way. So if you want free enterprise, you have to take on, if you want free enterprise to win, you have to take on corporate welfare. And if you're going to do that, if you want free enterprise to win, XM has got to go. Very interesting debate between these two people. And uh, as usual, I'd like to declare myself the winner of this debate. <laughs> and I do, in all, uh, instances. And I do, I do that mainly because I got to listen to two very interesting people <laughs> and some very good questions. Uh, I want to thank AEI, uh, Carlin. Most of all, I want to thank Tony Prado, Tim Carney, uh, for a very interesting debate. I think uh, they'll be hanging around at least for a few minutes if you want to say hello. Uh, I've unfortunately got to get to a train back to uh, NYC where they know how to drive, uh, and I'll actually get back there. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out.